I'm delighted today to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Yasmin Hurd. Dr. Hurd received her undergraduate degree from SUNY uh, Binghamton in uh, biochemistry and behavior. She went on to uh, receive her uh, PhD in uh, psychoneuropharmacology from uh, the Karolinska Institute. She was a fellow at the NIH and subsequently returned to the Karolinska for faculty position. Following her time at the Karolinska, she moved in 2006 to Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. At Mount Sinai, Dr. Hurd holds the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience and is a professor of uh, pharmacological sciences, neuroscience, and psychiatry. She also is the director of the Addiction Institute. Dr. Hurd's science is internationally recognized and, and highly interdisciplinary. Her work spans molecular biology, behavioral neuropharmacology, uh, uh, genetics, human neuroimaging, and animal models. Her lab addresses pressing translational questions about the neurobiology of drug abuse and related psychiatric disorders. And she has a primary focus on op opioid abuse and the developmental effects of cannabis. Dr. Hurd's science and her advocacy of drug addiction education and treatment have been recognized with many honors. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine, a recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for Neuroscience, and a Distinguished Scientist Award from uh, the Child Mind Institute. Today, she'll be talking with us about human molecular studies and translating addiction towards novel interventions. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hurd. You know, it's really great to um, be here, not completely uh, there, but I look forward to um, another year when we can be in person. I'm going to share my screen now. So for me, um, you know, listening to a number of the discussions um, today, and especially um, Lenny Bernstein and, and Keith, it's, it's been a journey to this point of really trying to understand and develop treatments for substance use disorders. And as the director of the Addiction Institute um, at Mount Sinai, um, wait, I'm just making sure. Um, thanks. Um, getting a couple of chats. <laughs> Sorry. Um, as the director of the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai, uh, this is clearly a huge issue for us, and especially opiate use disorder, where we um, have over 12,000 patients, and um, 6,000 of them are, are treated nearly daily, none past COVID, with like methadone. This has been incredible on many levels because this opioid crisis we can be brought onto ourselves in part, a lot of the things Lenny Bernstein and Keith have mentioned, but it is still incredible that the stigma that has led to a lot of substance use disorders um, and the crisis and the economic burden and the overdose deaths, and I'm going to talk about treatments not used and not um, suitable, but one of the things I want to emphasize is also in the past year with COVID, that COVID stress and isolation has led to a, a significant amount of drug use, and a lot of it being opioids as, as well. And you know, the toxin, that's what I call fentanyl, has has, um, has increased dramatically. But so and has the drug overdose deaths, and as um, as I said, Lenny Bernstein, as, as indicated earlier, it's incredible that yes, we have this horrible pandemic, and we have overlooked in part that this overdose, you know, epidemic is still here. And so the question is, how can we really come to um, understand and develop treatments for substance use disorder that really take the lives of a lot of people and impact so many, as all of you know? And I have this kind of historical, fast overview of treatments for substance use disorders. They exist, and people have tried from 1919, from even morphine maintenance clinics, and I think a lot of people don't even realize that, that existed in the U.S. However, the first true um, and still used um, opioid treatment is methadone, and that was nearly 60 years ago in 1964. Since then, most of the medications have still focused in large part on the opioid system, um, whether in a better opioid agonist than methadone, but still we are really um, not addressing a lot of the issues that the people with opioid use disorder uh, require. And it comes back to some of the things of stigma, while, you know, why so many people who need treatment don't get it. 
Um, there is a lot of uh, governmental regulations on the clinical side for treating with an opioid agonist. And we're still stuck with, there's a lot of great science, but how do we move that great science to novel treatments? And for me, a large part of the work that I, I've done had focused on the human brain. We've known a lot, and, and, and Stanford, you guys have been phenomenal. And, you know, um, I know there are mixed people in the audience, so just giving general overviews. We know a lot of different neurobiological systems that are critical for different aspects of substance use disorders, from the nucleus accumbens, um, in mediating reward, goal expectation directed behaviors to different areas of the prefrontal cortex, such as orbital frontal cortex in terms of cognitive flexibility, goal-directed behavior, the amygdala of emotional regulation, and so on. But the question that I had asked from a very um, early phase was, you know, can, can understanding the molecular signatures in the human brain help guide a better understanding of the disorder that could then give insights into new treatments. And so I'll just talk on, about a couple of the things that we've done over the years. I should probably make sure I keep, you know, time. Um, but this is, you know, basically the formulating part in terms of trying to understand gene expression in relation to epigenetic mechanisms, and we'll come to it, and I'm not going to talk a lot about genetics, but all of this coming back to translating to the functional proteins and the, the phenotype and the disease itself. And when we looked in the postmortem human brains of human heroin users, um, we started off in most of my studies looking at cocaine when they told us we really couldn't do molecular studies in the human brain and it was very tough to get anything published. But it, it was clear that we could see signatures that could distinguish um, opioid users or cocaine users from controls. And one of the things that was clear in... Um, some of our studies were that there is significant dysregulation of glutamatergic genes. And perhaps that's not surprising. We know that the prefrontal cortex, I, I should have said that the molecular changes that we were looking at and sequencing were done in the nucleus accumbens and in the dorsal striatum. And we know that the prefrontal cortex um, sends significant glutamatergic regulation uh, to, the, to the striatum, to the nucleus accumbens. And, and those glutamatergic changes and synaptic plasticity-related changes, while surprising for us, weren't so unexpected. What was unexpected, because uh, I wasn't studying epigenetics at that time, was really the profound changes of the epigenetic signature on the gene expression level. And for those who are not as, um, as I said, I know this is uh, a, a mixed audience that's told in part, in terms of those who don't understand aspects of epigenetics, and we inherit our DNA sequence from our parents and our genetics are pretty sad. But epigenetics allows the, um, the environment to control gene, gene um, expression activity. For example, um, genes can um, be turned off, that should be turned on, and, and other parts of the genome could be open across certain genes when they should be turned off. And it's this um, where there are a lot of epigenetic mechanisms. I'm not going to go into them really, um, but there are a lot of modifications along the DNA, whether it's methylation. Um, we know that um, acetylation of lyse specific lysine tails will lead to either turning on and off certain genes. And so it's looking at that complex, and these are not all of the genes that are changed, but the complex of genes that were changed at that time when we did our first studies, we could see that there was a prediction of increased acetylation in human heroin users. And we could replicate that on a number of levels, but we could also see that the, the glutamatergic-related um, genes actually correlated with these epigenetic related marks relevant to acetylation in heroin users, but not in controls. And at that time, an MD PhD student, Gabor Gavari, who's now even looking for his first faculty positions, um, was able to look at the uh, histone tails and to identify that there are specific epigenetic changes occurring. It's not that there's everything that's changed with in, in human heroin users, it's specific, there are specific changes and importantly, the acetylation changes related to their years of heroin use. Importantly, we could also um, see these um, epigenetic and glutamatergic changes uh, using different mechanisms, but importantly, we could um, replicate this in the animal models. 
So animals that actually self-administer heroin themselves, where we could we know their history, their friends, everybody, we could see that these the ch these changes both um, in the genes related to these epigenetic marks and to these glomatergic um, dysregulation were changed in the animal model, similar to what we saw in humans. So the question is, what do these epigenetic um, changes mean? And we know that a lot of these acetylated, um, the acetylation of, of these, these uh, histone tails, and specifically where we saw them, that these acetylated tails are, uh, the acetylated lysine the residues are read by these bromodomain um, proteins. And there are but three family um, of these bromodomain um, proteins, this BT family of, of bromodomain proteins in the brain, BRD2 to 4. And they have different expression throughout um, in different cell types and different um, brain regions. But we could see that in human heroin users, what was changed was predominantly ERD4. And in, in different cohorts that we looked at, and again, also replicating in our animal models. And this was interesting because these BRD4 um, changes strongly correlated with these marks of synaptic plasticity. Here, this is DLG4, which is the gene that um, for PSD95, um, that sits at the postsynaptic density. And so the question for us was, these epigenetic changes that we see that are specific, could they be something that we could start to develop as potential treatments? And studying these um, these specific BRD4s is, is, was possible, I thought at least at the time, to develop medications just because there were a lot of these um, BRD, these BET inhibitors that were being developed for the cancer field. And in cancer, there um, a lot of us in, in neuroscience have learned a lot from the cancer field in regard to epigenetic mechanisms. And they gave us a, a, a guide. At that time, we used a prototypical um, BT inhibitor at that time, which was JQ1, in our animal model. So we could see that in animals that self-administered heroin, if we, we first infused it into um, into the striatum, and we could indeed decrease heroin self-administration in these animals and their seeking behavior. But importantly, if we're going to develop medicine, the question was, can, does it work systemically? And indeed, we were able to give systemic um, inhibitors of the BRD4, which, um, well, we've tried other uh, BRD4 inhibitors and um, they have not crossed the blood brain barrier so well. But for this one, the JQ1, as I said, the initial um, prototypical um, BT inhibitor, we were able to see indeed that it could reduce heroin self administration um, profoundly. So, from our initial studies of the human brain, we could see that indeed the history of heroin use does correlate to specific epigenetic disturbances as well as genes related to synaptic plasticity of these glutamatergic genes, and also that they mediate aspects of drug-seeking behavior and drug-taking behavior. But I want to emphasize that it wasn't specific just for heroin. And I think that this is important when we're trying to develop medication for substance use disorders. There are many, of, um, many individuals who have an opiate use disorder will also um, use other drugs. So for me, if the drug is not necessarily only going to target opioid use disorder, I'm fine with that. Here, other groups have shown that indeed these inhibitors of BRD4, not only in our hands that decreased heroin self-administration, but they could see that it decreased also um, cocaine place preference in terms of the reward. They could show just like we saw for heroin that it could increase cocaine um, uh, increase BRD4 levels, cocaine ex exposure, and also when they um, they injected um, the same um, BT inhibitor JQ1, they could also reduce cocaine place preference and also cocaine self administration. So for me, that definitely um, became a path that we thought that we could go down. However, it's been a journey, and I'm I'm going to be ha happy to answer questions regarding where we are with our BRD um, treatment development, because a lot of it comes back to stigma of even the companies wanting to help to have their product be associated with substance use disorders. And another part for me in terms of the studies that we did of the human brain, um, we had also used another strategy, not just looking at um, 
gene expression in terms of the transcriptome of RNA sequencing or microarray in our initial studies, but we also wanted to look at the epigenome. And so we used a technique called attack sequencing, which is an assay for transposes accessible chromatin, basically looking at chromatin accessibility. So where in the genome may be open or closed that would be associated with um, regulating um, active transcription or uh, reduced transcription. And the thing that's important about this technique for us and for many of the techniques that we develop and we try to work with with the human brain is that it allowed us to use a very small amount of tissue because every person is very unique. And it also allowed us to look at in different cell populations. So here we're looking at, for example, neuron and, and glia. And once again, Gabor, we were able to identify that um, a particular gene was predictive of the, those individuals with opioid use um, heroin, I should say heroin abuse, and this gene was FIN. And importantly, um, the, the, this locus that was significantly affected by um, in heroin users, it explained about 68% of the variance of, this, of heroin use. So, and we were able to show with my students, Tony, that this is functional. It was in an enhancer region. And again, I'm not going to go into um, um, the details on a molecular level, but we were glad to see that at least it was a functional association. Importantly, there seems to be cell specificity because it was specifically in neurons that this, we had this open state in the actually in the fin promoter, not in glia. So what's fin? So fin is very interesting on many levels. Um, it's a oops, just a, it's a SAR kinase, um, uh, tyrosine kinase, a member of the, the postsynaptic density, and it regulates the set of architectural dynamics. And in one sense, perhaps, you know, if we had been smart, we would have been able to find this by going into, you know, one gene or one protein at a time. But um, looking at across the epigenome, that this locus really was what um, was most associated with um, heroin use in, in the striatum was, in the, and I'm going to come back in the dorsal striatum, was really interesting. We also um, use many different strategies when we get sequencing data from our human subjects. And here, for example, uh, my student, Randy Ellis, if we use machine learning, here is looking at the orbital frontal cortex, which also, as I said earlier, plays a really critical role in addiction neural circuitry for cognitive flexibility, goal-directed behavior. And again, looking at human heroin users versus control, just basically ask the machine, you know, for machine learning um, algorithms, what is predictive of a heroin user as, com as compared to a control? And once again, what showed up even here was FIN. So FIN is interesting, not just in the striatum, where we spent most of our time now on a mechanistic level trying to understand it, but also in other brain regions that we see. Here we could also see not only at the epigenetic level is FIN um, dysregulated, but also on the gene expression level in human um, striatum, also in the rat, um, and in the rat, the fin expression correlates to the amount of drugs that they use. And we can also see it even in, in cell cultures. However, what is critical for fin as a kinase is that whether or not it's active. And we could see indeed that um, in heroin users, there is an increase of active fin. And this was also, we saw that the uh, amount of total fin correlated with their, the years of heroin use. We are now going into more depth because FIN has gotten a little bit more complicated, but one of the things that we do see in terms of not just cell specificity and going into, I'm not gonna show single cell stuff today, but also the sub-regional um, uh, areas of the striatum. And as many of us in the, in the, in the field knows, that different um, areas of the striatum, such as the, even in the dorsal striatum, may mediate different aspects of goal-directed behavior, habitual behavior, and it's that habitual behavior that leads to that compulsion, the quote-unquote addiction. And we know that in a lot of studies that the dorsal medial is much more um, associated with goal-directed behavior while the dorsal lateral more in, the, in, in habitual behavior. And where we see, here's MDP2 student, Jeremy, and we're going into single cell stuff, where we see um, the changes in fin are, mainly, are most strongly in the dorsal lateral, this habitual circuitry. But I'm going to come back to one of the, the, the things that we 
uh, for me was most interesting about Finn, not because of, um, sorry, I'm just moving this, not because of um, it's uh, as a as a kinase, this role in in, in regulating um, the glutamatergic signal is really critical. But also, Finn, it, it also phosphorylates tau, and hyperphosphorylated tau, as many of you know, is a, a pathological feature of a number of neurodegenerative disorders, of tauopathies, and including Alzheimer's. And we were able to see a number of years ago that there was in, indeed increased phosphorylated tau in the brains of human heroin users. At that time, I thought that, okay, they just basically hit their heads because they're you know, um, maybe falling down often in, with their um, substance use. But here, this is an epigenetic change that definitely does not have to do with hitting heads. And we were able to replicate that again in our, in our animal model, that there's increased phosphorylated tau with heroin use. And it's very specific to where fin binds um, phosphorylates tau, not other sites. And we were able to knock down and decreasing um, fin expression and also regulate heroin self-administration. So for medication development, um, many of the people, including later on, you'll hear from Marina Giotto from Yale, where they have done a lot of studies with um, a particular fin um, medication, sarcadinib. And sarcadinib is a fin inhibitor. And we were able to see in animals that we could you know, really have them work hard for their heroin and give them sarcadinib during that the time period. And during those sessions, they would decrease their heroin self-administration with sarcadinib. Importantly, it was specific to the drug because we did not see changes of sarcadinib in affecting their food self-administration, which I think is, is really critical when you're developing, that one of many things that's very critical when you're trying to develop medication for substance use disorders, obviously you don't want to impact every aspect of, of their, of their you know, reward um, and, and, and food intake. So from our molecular studies, we know that there are specific epigenetic changes and specific synaptic dysregulation um, that linked to this glutamatergic pathology that we're hoping to develop um, treatments for. Other groups, Dorit Ron, um, also saw that sarcadinib reduced heroin self-administration um, as well. So alcohol use, self-administration, increased fin, just like we saw in our heroin users, and for her, it was able to decrease um, uh, alcohol self-administration. However, the Yale group, that they've now conducted, finished a clinical study in people with an alcohol use disorder, and the sarcadinib treatment, at least in, in, under their, those conditions, did not decrease alcohol consumption. So this is the thing in terms of you know, trying to now move to um, clinical trials to see what works and what doesn't. Of course, there's a lot, of, perhaps in terms of dosage and the amount of use, but they also, in their um, mouse model, was not able to see that it's uh, that sarcadinib significantly decreased alcohol intake. Um, and so that definitely, there's a lot of questions whether or not this might work, but there's still a long way to go. Um, Another area for me in terms of why studying the human brain, I think is really critical. And on a molecular level, because I would not bring this an old study that we're still trying to, as I said, move to another level, um, is, is really, it starts off looking at anxiety and major depression, because these are very common among people with a substance use disorder. And many, many years ago, trust me, many years ago, I saw in the amygdala, of people who had major depression, that there was this dysregulation of their endogenous opioid prodynorphin. And prodynorphin is an opioid that relates to negative aversive states in particular. But it was very fascinating because I saw this also in people who were heroin users, and we did different cohorts of, of people with heroin use, of heroin use, Sarah and Anderson, and MDPH student at the time, and replicated again in people with major depression disorder. But the question was, oh, sorry, we, the question was where this was occurring. It was occurring in an obscure nuclei, uh, nucleus of the amygdala. The amygdala has multiple, like 15 or more um, subnuclei, and no one really studies this. This is the perimygdaloid cortex we were able to find it in animals that self-administer heroin and then did a combination of um, uh, micro pet use and FTG um, and also dread technology to change the firing activity of these um, cells, of these dynorphin expressing cells, and was able to see that interestingly, 
just changing the activity of these dynorphin cells in the periamygdaloid cortex activated the circuitry, which was um, uh, uh, Leonard Haim Hamer and George Halid many years ago had framed the extended amygdala and it, its potential role in motiv motivated behaviors. So for me, not um, this circuit not only could change if we change the firing activity of these cells, we could change their cortisol levels, we could change their anhedonic effects and their depression-like behavior. So in this audience, obviously circuit-specific uh, modulation that's guided by molecular signatures that we can find in human subjects, to me, are also important for treatment development. And the last phase that I'll quickly uh, end on is, um, cannabinoids. And it's even though it didn't derive initially from molecular studies of, our, of the human brain, it's we are ending on it. And it comes back to the fact that we've been studying the developmental effects of, of cannabis. And when we study the developmental effects of cannabis in our animal models, at least, we use THC. And we could see whether it's prenatal exposure to THC or adolescent exposure, that these animals would self-administer heroin more. But cannabis has many cannabinoids. And so we start to study other cannabinoids. Here is cannabidiol. And we could see it had a different effect to THC. While THC would invariably increase heroin self-administration, CBD, cannabidiol, would decrease it. But it decreased not self-administration, but the drug-seeking behavior um, induced by environmental cues. Basically, um, just like our human um, uh, opioid um, patients who, for whom the environmental triggers are really key for their relapse. We, as I showed you before, we knew the molecular changes in the human brain regarding heroin, and we could see that CBD actually did, re, um, um, some of the changes that we saw in glutamatergic genes, you could um, normalize with CBD, including not only the glutamatergic, and some of the synaptic plasticity genes, but also even the cannabinoid receptor was normalized by um, CBD. So here we did carry um, clinical trials that um, are published so I can talk about it compared to some of the others. And here's a double-blinded randomized placebo control study. And we could see that in people who we showed different heroin cues or neutral cues, those who had received placebo craved and CBD reduced that. A week later, because that we had seen weeks after um, in our animal models of receiving CBD, that CBD still had an effect even weeks after their last administration. And a week after the, the the study participants received um, CBD, we were able to see that they still, it still reduced their craving. One thing that was also interesting for us was that, um, which we hadn't studied in the animals at that time, was that the people reported that th th those who had received placebo had high anxiety, and CBD reduced that um, with the Q-induced effects. A week later, CBD was still reducing their Q-induced um, anxiety um, in those uh, as compared to placebo. As I said, we at that time, we hadn't studied it in our animal models, but now we are able to do that. So using the, the data that we've generated in humans, here at my post on Jackie Ferlin, we were able to, it's a complicated, but I'm just going to say here we used um, a, a shock. So we shock animals with a Q. And when we expose them to that um, particular cue, here is a lemon odor, and they received a control vehicle, they showed um, anxiety-like behavior in our model. And those that received CBD with that cue, it, CBD blunts that, normalizes that anxiety behavior, no matter how we've looked at it. We're now looking at the molecular changes, and we now can see that CBD is impacting on certain circuits um, in regard to its impact to reduce at least anxiety-related um, behavior. And some of these circuits are not surprising, perhaps in terms of the basal lateral amygdala, the nucleus accumbens chow, and the prelimbic cortex. But back to the humans, um, in a lot of human studies, obviously, there are subjective reports. And so in addition to these subjective reports, we could see um, at cortisol levels that those people who were shown the drug cue, their cortisol levels went up and CBD reduced that consistent with their reducing of their anxiety and reducing um, their craving. Similarly, their heart rates went up when they saw drug cue um, for those who had placebo and CBD reduced that. So 
for us, we've been following this path for a while now in terms of does cannabidiol hold promise for, for treatment? And definitely we can save in aspects of craving and anxiety. We had two pilot studies, but we're still trying to understand the dose, the, uh, the treatment regimen, and so on. But other groups have also looked at it. And here, Bert Weiss's group looked at for alcohol. And again, you see this is not, um, CBD is not, quote unquote, say specific just to opioids here they were able to see weeks after giving cbd that that it decreased the alcohol intake in their in their rat model and even when the animals were stressed in terms of stress induced reinstatement behavior other groups have also found some of uh, these changes but there seems to be some sex dependent effects so these are something that we're going to have to um, consider sorry here for example at certain doses that worked well for male rats, it did, CBD did not work for females until they really enhanced the doses of CBD significantly. So these are things that we're trying to look at in, in, our, in, our, launch, in our large um, clinical trial for cannabidiol for opiate use disorder, and also with neuroimaging now to see whether or not we will see the similar circuits that are um, we're molecular circuits that we can see in, in our animal model can we see certain comparable things in our human neuroimaging studies? So with that, I will say that definitely the human brain is able to give us a lot of insights about the molecular signatures that are pretty unique for, um, for opiate use disorders. And I could talk about cocaine later, but a lot of it comes back down to what we all know um, now in terms of the synaptic plasticity gone awry, and these epigenetic changes that maintain these effects long into, into um, across life, but they also lend themselves for treatment. And I think one of the things that people fail to think about with these epigenetic changes that clearly is very characteristic of how the, the brain is changed with addiction is that epigenetics is reversible. It's not our genetics. These are reversible. And so for me, that now gives hope for recovery. So I've said, you know, I've mentioned a number of people along the way. Um, Dr. Ed Salsis is an amazing addiction medicine doc who has been a pleasure to, to work with and just taking things from the clinic and translating to our animal models as well. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, we have time for some questions uh, starting in the room. I have one question regarding the CBD findings that you just shared out. Um, the effects on craving, are they, do you have a feel for whether they're mediated through the effects on anxiety and stress, and if there are other mechanisms that impact those uh, physiological and psychological responses, you'll have the same outcome, or um, do you think it might be the other way around, or they're independent? I think that they're closely matched. I think that um, CBD's effects on anxiety um, in, in, in certain types of anxiety, it's not, just, it's not general anxiety, and I think that that's, um, the relationship to the craving is, is pretty strong. So we're hoping to tease certain things apart in our animal models, but you know, in our animal models, craving the way we obviously we measure it is very different from how we, we measure it in humans, but we're looking at different components of drug-seeking behavior, um, different types of drug-seeking behavior, and different anxiety-related models to see if we can tease it apart. But so far, even in the animal models, it looks dissimilar. It looks similar. Great, thank you. Hi, Yasmin. Julie Cower. Um, Hi, Julie. Nice to hear your talk. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, do, do you know whether your CBD effects might have anything to do with the dynorphin kappa opiate receptor signal? Um, it might. And I, I don't want to say too much right now um, uh, for a couple of reasons. <laughs> uh, we're, we're going down a little of a rabbit hole and I don't know if we're going to come out of it, but there does seem to be some link um, to dynorphin, and, and we'll see if, if that holds up with some of the studies that we're doing. Sorry that I can't be more informative. 
Um, Marion Buckwalter, um, fabulous talk. I really, really enjoyed it. You said something at the beginning that really struck me. There's definitely a problem with translating these kinds of discoveries and trials into people in all kinds of diseases. But you said that drug companies don't want to be associated with treatments for addiction. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what might improve that. I think that's clearly a giant barrier. Thank you so much for that question, because it's a huge barrier. I mean, obviously, everyone, you know, loves to help children, you know, with, with cancer and these childhood disorders or, or you know, but uh, as I think the, you know, Lenny Bernstein talked with Keith about the stigma of, you know, that the substance use disorders, they brought it on themselves, they have low morals. And so companies in terms of some aspect of that stigma rubbing off on them, but also in the fact that many people don't think that people with substance use disorders will pay for those medications. So, you know, um, antidepressants or, you know, actually non-psychiatric drugs obviously come in, get um, a lot of, come in with a lot of money. And I think it's also a financial one as well, but I think stigma plays a large, large part. I can say that one thing about the opioid crisis that has changed, I think, a lot of people um, is that when they saw that it's, you know, the person next door that was getting um, addicted to opioids and dying from opioids, when they thought, oh, it's only those people in that community or so on. That has changed, I think, a lot of people, the perception of substance use disorder, that anyone can develop a substance use disorder and anyone can die. And I think that that's helping. So I think more recently, I've gotten a little bit, um, I've gotten perhaps less of a big pushback. I mean, it's still get pushed back, but um, from companies, but um, it, it's been challenging, I will say, you know, we, it's been very challenging. There was a related question online, um, which I think maybe you're, you're already implicitly addressing. Um, the, uh, the question from Jack Pollock, asking whether or not you actually have developed some you know, targets for BRD4 uh, inhibition uh, for humans, and are they sort of ready to go, but you're facing this resistance, or is there still work uh, in that development? And they're still working on that development. I definitely face resistance, I will tell you, from BRD4 um, companies. Um, a colleague at Mount Sinai, they've been working on developing their own, and so we're hoping the problem has been just, as I said before, blood-brain barrier. Um, uh, issues. And so we're not yet at the clinical stage. So if you know anyone, please let me know. I would really appreciate your help. Any, if you know of any companies that would want to help us, that would be great. But, but yeah, we've definitely been having a tough time finding partners in, in the, in the non-academic space. Great. There's another question online uh, from Marina. My apologies mm -hmm. if I butcher your name. Pichotto? <laughs> All right. Pichio, so uh, She'll be talking. <laughs> uh, so great, great talk. Uh, what do you think about the idea of pairing drugs to reverse epigenetic consequences? Uh, sorry, my screen just jumped in a moment. Uh, just jumped. I, I, uh, wait, epigenetic I was, consequences of drugs with behavioral therapies. Absolutely. And this is the thing, again, I want to emphasize. I think after all these years of studying substance use disorders and the molecular changes, these these are epigenetic changes, and it means, therefore, that they're reversible. So we talk about, yes, epigenetic um, modifications maintain these long-lasting impact on the brain, but they're reversible. And so, Marina, absolutely, um, epigenetic drugs that can open up um, learning, relearning, that's where behavioral therapists come into play. So I absolutely think that behavioral therapy in conjunction with epigenetic um, medications could absolutely work. Yeah, and I didn't do do you know full justice to the question. Uh, one of the you know uh, core of the question is whether that combination will actually increase the specificity of the treatments, given that you're yes. some general effects. Yeah, and one of the things I mean, we're learning more about you know these epigenetic mechanisms are. It's also about the specificity of the cells and firing activity. So certain epigenetic um, signatures when, with cell firing and it opens up for a certain window, you can then perhaps use that window for these behavioral interventions. So I do think that that's where I see the how the behavioral um, therapy with epigenetic um, medications could work. 
great. Time for one last question back there. Um, hello, how's it, how's it going? Uh, I'm Andres, nice to meet you. Um, so very short and kind of following up with the, with the last question, I mean, um, just uh, you, I want to ask you about what you think, the, I mean, because let me backtrack a little bit. So we've discussed quite a lot of molecular targets um, and kind of being a bit of the, let's say, clinical um, perspective in the sense that a lot of the treatments that we're offering these people are currently psychotherapy based. And the main, you know, um, I mean, the main, I think, function of, uh, you know, naltrexone or naloxone or any of the, even methadone, uh, is aligning themselves with psychotherapy treatments. So, um, you know, keeping that in focus that you, you see in these patient groups actually quite good outcomes exclusively, as you said in, in, in the, your answer to the last question, with behavioral interventions. Do you know of any evidence uh, currently being uh, tested in randomized controlled trials about possible psychotherapeutic, uh, you know, uh, t let's say types of therapy or, or, or the conjunction of psychotherapy with uh, molecular targets, as you explained? So um, I don't know of any one, any clinical trial that's currently going on with those two. I mean, like you said, for the opioid treatments, definitely psychotherapy and the groups and so on are something that we all encourage people to do. But they're not done in the same structured manner. And as I mentioned, a lot of patients don't want to take opioid drugs for different reasons. And just on the, you know, the, the clinical enterprise that using opioid treatments are there's a huge burden to them so i mean i do hope that the novel targets that are non-addictive themselves um will lend would lend themselves to being able to partner with um, psychotherapy the behavioral therapy that marina just um, mentioned and i think that that but i don't really know of any um any anything right now but that's the goal. But I think that medications by themselves first, that's the issue, right? They haven't really gone through um, full FDA. There's no new FDA approved medications. And once those happen, then you can add behavioral therapies to them. Okay, great. Let's thank Yasmin again for a really great talk. Thank you.